from the shores of beautiful Lake Coeur d'Alene in the heart of North Idaho. Local, regional, national, and international guests discuss their topics on our forum. The North Idaho College Public Forum. With your host and moderator, political scientist, Tony Stewart. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure to welcome you back to our series that is titled Journey Through America's 20th Century. We, over the past few weeks, have been bringing you discussions with famous people in history in this country over the last 100 years, and we wish to continue that today. Uh, we wish to welcome to the program from the past history, Margaret Sanger, who lived from 1883 until 1966. She is known as a pioneer of the birth control movement in the United States. She was a nurse in New York City uh, in the slum areas working with the poor. She opened a birth control clinic in Brooklyn in 1916. She was the first president of the International Planned Parenthood Federation and took that position in 1953. She led the movement that resulted in the legal and public sanction of contraceptives in the United States. Ms. Sanger, welcome to the program. Thank you for coming from the past history to be with us, uh, not only on this program, but you also appeared uh, at, before a large audience at North Idaho College. Uh, let us start out by talking a little bit more about you. And uh, throughout history, there's been lots written on you since, uh, even since your death. Uh, and there's been a lot of praise, and there's also been criticism. But would you just share with our viewers a little bit more about uh, your career and how you became so involved in this particular issue? Well, I'm very happy to be here today and to address your audience. Shall I start with my background yes, as, I, as I was growing up? Well, when I was born into my family, the Higgins family in Corning, New York, I learned firsthand that poverty and large families go hand in hand. I was the uh, sixth of 11 children born to my parents. And my mother um, and father were both Irish immigrants. My mother, as I said, she gave birth to, I was the sixth out of 11. Well, she was actually pregnant 18 times in 22 years. And I saw what um, that did to her. Um, she was always pregnant. As I saw, she was always exhausted. Uh, she was always sick. She had tuberculosis. And so uh, I remember her actually holding one of our brothers or sisters in her arms and coughing so violently that she had to put herself up against a wall so she wouldn't fall down. And she died before she was 50 years old because of tuberculosis and too many children. My father, whom I loved, he... Um, Excuse me for interrupting. Do you have your microphone there? I believe I do. Um, okay. uh, thank you, Ms. Singer, because your microphone is covered up and I was afraid that we weren't being hearing you, so if you don't is that mind. Okay? Oh, oh, that's fine. Thank you. for All these modern things yes, I'm not very that you're not familiar used to. with. Is so that I just better? want to make sure. Thank you. Sorry mm -hmm. for interrupting. No, that's quite all right. So my father, my, my mother died before she was 50, and my father lived to be 82 years old. And it seemed to me that that simply wasn't fair, and that was not the kind of life that I wanted to have, as my mother had. So I had a chance to make a difference in my life. I went to, to a nice private school, uh, thanks to my sisters. So they, they, they raised money, and, and you were chosen as the one I to was be. chosen. Um, it was a blessing for me at the time, believe me, because at that school, my uh, intelligence was celebrated. I had kind of a defiant spirit, but that was made into a leadership quality, and I decided then I was going to become a doctor. Uh, but that wasn't to be. My mother got very ill with tuberculosis. I had to go home and take care of her. And when she died, I stuck around for about two years taking care of my father and my younger brothers and sisters. And to be a doctor was never to be. Um, I was a woman. I had no money. I had no connection. So I decided to become a nurse. And at that point, admission of women into medical school was very rare. Oh, very rare. Very rare. It was almost unheard of. But it was uh, common for a woman, uh, if she were going to become something in the professions, to become a nurse. And uh, I become an obstetric nurse, uh, to, uh, specializing in maternity and in delivering babies. And so uh, I, that's where I began my uh, understanding of what women were facing, uh, the poor women were facing. You see, in my time, uh, it was against the law to even speak of such things as birth control. And, and certainly couldn't distribute them. Oh, no, it was against the Comstock laws at the time. But even uh, forbid to even have, it was 
uh, forbidden and not thought to be free speech or free play. Absolutely. Um, if you published anything about birth control, it would be very likely that you might end up in jail. In fact, uh, even doctors uh, fear and trembling of being arrested for providing birth control information to women. It just was unheard of at the time. Now, as you uh, got into your profession and you saw some real tragedies, oh. and not only in your own personal life, your mother, but in others. But first of all, let me back up and say, your mother died at a quite young age. Yes, yes, before she was 50 years old, as a result of too many pregnancies and the tuberculosis, yes. And then you, you attended to women who were pregnant and died in childbirth or, or shortly thereafter? Yes, um, I was unable to finish my two years of nursing training. Uh, I married, and at that time, uh, if you were married, you could not stay in nursing school. So I had one year of nursing, and uh, that was enough to allow me to work with the poorest women uh, in the um, Lower East Side of Manhattan. These were mostly immigrant women. And uh, Mr. Stewart, the conditions were deplorable. Uh, most of the women uh, had at least 10 children. Uh, they could speak no English. Uh, they lived in maybe a two-room tenement slums. Um, and when I was attending at their births, uh, which should be the happiest time of their life, when they already had nine or ten children, uh, often I would see them cry a tear of, of joy when one of their children was born dead because at least there would not be another mouth to feed or the child dying in their first year of life. I believe you've also indicated in some of your speeches and writings that uh, later in life when, when things started changing policies, but as you look back upon that, that when we hear a discussion about abortion and all that, there were certainly abortions in those days too. When I would leave the slums on a Saturday night, I would often see women lined up around the block waiting to get into one of the clinics for a Saturday night abortion. Now, Mr. Stewart, you have to understand, back in 1910, 1911, in the United States, we had more abortions than any other country in the world. It's and, estimated one or two million. And yet they were illegal, but they still were going on. They were illegal, uh, and yet we turned you know, a blind eye to that. And yet here we had uh, laws that forbade doctors to give women safe alternatives. It was against the law. I mean, to me, uh, that's an obscenity. Uh, the women who went to these uh, clinics for their, with their five dollars. Many of them were permanently damaged. Uh, some of them went home and hemorrhaged to death. And these were often the kind of women that I would have to try to take care of. Another area I'd like for you to be able to clear up, because there are a segment of society that's always opposed birth control, yes. and since you were the pioneer, uh, one might call you even the mother of the movement, obviously. I did coin the term, by the way, yes. birth control. Yes, right. Uh, so. So many people since then who have not followed your history carefully contend that not only were you for birth control, but you were a, a very strong supporter of abortion. Would you clear that up? Oh, uh, absolutely not. I, I was uh, anti-abortion. In my mind, it was important for a woman to take responsibility for reproduction. And in my mind, uh, an abortion was not an acceptable choice. And actually, people misunderstand me also. It was my belief, or it is my belief, that uh, people should remain celibate until they're married. And birth control should be for married couples. And so I don't understand why they're, you know, today we would say, well, what is the big uh, controversy? In my mind, that makes uh, complete moral sense. So you're indicating that through providing the information and distribution of uh, birth control, then you lessen the uh, moral dilemma of facing the issue of abortion. Oh, absolutely. In my mind, uh, nobody should have to make that decision uh, to have an abortion. Now, true, there may be extenuating circumstances with the health of the mother and when the physician says this is the only possibility. But, Mr. Stewart, in my mind, when hundreds of thousands of abortions being performed in 1910, 1911 was a disgrace to civilization. And so women needed to take on the responsibility of controlling their reproduction. But, of course, in my day, it was against the law to, to obtain that information. While you're visiting us here in the year 2000, I want you to have the opportunity to respond to another charge. Mm -hmm. You also have been charged in more modern times, that people look back at your life, that somehow you were supportive of 
taking a look at the genetic makeup of persons and being genetically selective oh. uh, by, by race and background. Would you respond to that, Charlie? I think that um, I have been a bit maligned and that and misunderstood. We have to understand that I am a product of my times. And in the late, uh, well, like ni uh, 1915, 1916, early 1920s, there was a movement across the United States that promoted healthy children, healthy families. And is there anything wrong with promoting healthy children, healthy families? And in fact, uh, there were um, oh, contests in the United States to show people that you were of healthy mind and body. So I was in favor of healthy families. You see, uh, again, we forget the fact that when a woman would give birth to 9, 10, 12 children in succession, she had no opportunity for her body to heal, and also the succeeding children would become uh, sicker and sicker. In fact, uh, statistics bear out the fact that if you are the ninth child in a family, you had more than a 60 to 70 percent chance of dying in the first year of life. And so the eugenic situation, in, uh, it is my belief that we should have healthy children. And so I, I think people have misunderstood that. So your, your pioneering for birth control was concern for the, the mothers and their health and having healthy children. Absolutely. Uh, In uh, the Netherlands, I studied uh, their birth control clinics there, and I was amazed. They not only had the lowest birth rate in Europe, they had free birth control clinics, but they also had the lowest infant mortality rate. How can anybody, um, any thinking, uh, loving person, think that that would be a bad goal to achieve? Another issue that comes out of your family, uh, again, some of our viewers may not be aware of uh, your father's history, and, and again, he lived to be much older than your mother, which was true of the time because, again, of the, what you've just discussed. Uh, in our time, in 2000, your father would be looked upon as a very liberal, progressive oh, man yes. because in his day he was an abolitionist. Is that correct? He was very opposed to slavery. Yes, very interesting. Uh, my father was an Irish immigrant. He actually uh, came to Canada first, but at the age of 14, he left Canada just so he could sign up and fight with President Lincoln. President Lincoln was his absolute hero. And I was brought up with the belief that all people are created equal and all people should have freedom. And so uh, when people claim that I perhaps uh, you know, had some uh, racial uh, beliefs, I don't think they understand. Um, how I was brought up and the beliefs that uh, my father engendered in me. He was a remarkable person, by the way. Yes. And in his time, uh, the country was very early in his life, particularly the country was very divided. And, oh, yes. Uh, and the abolition of that day would be very similar to the 1960s in this time of dealing with segregation and trying to eradicate segregation. Uh, you were very much opposed in your time. And you were married, and you had a son, I believe, and a daughter. Is that correct? I had two sons and a daughter. Or two sons yes. and a daughter. Mm -hmm. uh, and you you had to to divide your time between your family and uh, what became a very important movement for you. Uh, correct me, if, uh, but I would say it was also partially a political movement because it required a change of law. Uh, how did you balance this dilemma between uh, what you wound up doing is actually going to jail, and, and how that affected you and your family? Well, yes, uh, what happened was that uh, I, after I went and decided that the birth control movement was going to be my goal in life, I was going to do something about it, I was going to start a revolution if I needed to, um, that I went to Europe with my husband, and um, that's where I began to study European methods of birth control. And when I returned to the United States, I started a magazine called The Woman Rebel. And the purpose of that magazine was to test the Comstock laws and to also provide women in writing uh, with justifiable, correct birth control information. And that came out within a week. I was charged with nine counts of obscenity. And if I were to be convicted, I was going to spend 45 years in uh, prison. So I was only in my 30s, and I decided that that could not happen. I was a mother. And I needed to do this for the women of the United States. So I, I left the United States. I uh, left my children with my husband and family members. And I went to uh, England completely outside of the law. And I was there for two years. Uh, so in terms of balancing uh, that particular part of my life, uh, perhaps I 
didn't balance that as well as I could have, but at that time I saw it as my only choice. You were caught in a very difficult situation. Yes, a very difficult situation. If you stayed here, you'd probably go to prison. I would have gone to prison. And if you're there, you would have more communication with your family. I would have been made, um, you know, like the showpiece for the Comstock laws. How dare a woman stand up and say that talking about birth control is not an obscenity? So it was a, a matter of free speech, and I simply could not face that 45 years in prison. And yet you were not willing to give up your, your cause that was no, important. No, I was single-minded. And that's what many people admired me for. Uh, the fact that I was a mother, though, this was, um, I was fairly admired by most feminists of the day. Uh, we had the suffragettes, and many of them never married, and yet I was married. Um, I had a devoted husband and uh, three children. They saw me as quite the role model. Yes. Mm -hmm. Now, you did return after a yes, period I of did. time. Mm -hmm. Share with us you, when, uh, happened on your, what happened on your return. Well, probably the only reason that I came back was that my husband, Bill, uh, had been tricked into giving one of my very uh, fairly explicit pamphlets to one of Mr. Comstock's people, and he was arrested. And Mr. Comstock was a very, uh, um, not only anti-family planning, but... Uh, self-righteous person, Mr. Stewart, very self-righteous. And, uh, and actually, my husband was actually uh, arrested by Mr. Comstock himself. And when I heard that, I decided right there and then that my husband could not take the blame for this, nor could he take the credit for all of the excitement in the United States now about birth control. So I did return. But what happened, um, this was probably the worst time in my life. When I returned, I had my three children. My little daughter, Peggy, who was only four at the time, uh, she died just 10 days after I returned. And uh, she died of complications of pneumonia and possibly of um, polio. And at that time, uh, a great public outcry came out that how could anybody send me to prison after I just lost my only daughter? It was a devastating time for me. And, uh, but then they still took action against you? Well, uh, they offered me a plea bargain because uh, now Mr. Comstock did not want me to become a martyr for the cause. But I refused to say I was guilty. And finally, uh, after a great public outcry, and because of the political tension, uh, all the charges were dropped. And, but I was told to behave, and I didn't. And then you did what? Well, uh, I went after uh, a few more months. I wrote letters all across the nation. I figured that uh, the time was right, and I went all across the nation to 116 different places, and I went on a public speaking tour. I went from Boston all the way to uh, Seattle, Portland. I was arrested in Portland, and I spent the night in jail. And I ended up in Spokane, Washington. That was my last stop on my uh, public speaking tour. And every place I went, it was a media event. Um, the police were there, people were arrested, but I gave out my birth control information to over 100,000 women. I felt very good about that. So you've returned to our Northwest uh, to be on this program and to yes, speak here. And mm -hmm. So you must be reminiscing some about when you were here. Uh, how were you received in Spokane when you came? I was received city? quite well, uh, but every place I went, uh, there was a lot of tension, and I liked that. Uh, I'm kind of a propagandist. The more attention I got, the better, because then people were talking about birth control. I have a philosophical question on that line. You and others who have been before and since your time, uh, as they've attempted to express themselves and, uh, and also print, uh, when individuals and organizations came along to censor them. One of the dilemmas of the censors is that it gives you so much publicity, it actually, mm. uh, in, a, in a very unusual way, promotes your work uh, or, or gives it more publicity than it would get without their uh, uh, opposition. Absolutely. In fact, I was called by many people nauseating slime. That's how I was referred because I was a female talking about birth control. And so when I went on my public speaking tour, I made sure that I looked very feminine. And when I started my speech, I started very quietly because everybody was there to see this horrible woman. And after I started speaking, they realized I was a mother and I was concerned about women's health. So the publicity was terrific for me. After this tour and, and all these things happened, tell us what you think the results have been of your movement. Uh, now that you come and visit and you look at where we're at today, um, what's your reaction to the change that took place because of your work and others like yourself. Well, I wonder if there has been such a change, Mr. Stewart. I understand that as a result of my speech the other day at your college, I received uh, 
there were some letters to the editor of the different newspapers uh, criticizing the fact that anybody would speak about such things in public. Have we come very far? I also wonder, Mr. Stewart, as I look at the television set, any given night uh, during the evening news, I'll see maybe two or three ads for, what do we call it, Viagra? Do we ever see ads for women's uh, situations to be able to control her, uh, the amount of uh, children? No. So I'm not sure we've come so far, Mr. Stewart. Let me approach from another viewpoint. Uh, the laws in our various states, and the United States Supreme mm -hmm. Court, uh, uh, some years ago in relation to a case out of Connecticut, yes. uh, actually said that the Constitution does permit the distribution and, and advertising of contraceptives. So I, I'm thinking in those arenas, have you made really a difference and it made a contribution from your perspective? Yes, after almost 50 years of fighting, mm -hmm. In fact, the Griswold versus Connecticut, uh, 1963, I believe right. it was, um, at that time, finally recognized by the Supreme Court that it was legal for married couples to privately practice birth control. I want to give you the opportunity to take some uh, additional credit. Without your work and your sacrifice and, and your controversy, would this movement have been much slower than what it turned out to be? Oh, absolutely. Um, there were other people talking about birth control. Um, we, I had some, there were other women at my time, but I was the one, I think, I think, with all due modesty, I believe I'm the one that made it happen. Um, because of my single-mindedness and the fact that I knew it was a revolution. It was not just something that maybe needed to be done. It was something that we had to press the laws, press the laws, test, and bring everything in, into the public's eye. Once the public understood, um, how important this was for women's health and for children's health, then I think uh, that's what made the big difference. Another question comes to light, and I want to take advantage of your presence here to ask this question. And that is, someone like yourself, it takes tremendous courage to uh, really sacrifice what you did to know that you might go to jail for 45 years and that you did have a family. What is it in some individuals, uh, some form of, of inner concepts that gives you that kind of strength and courage to really test the system as it is? A, a great uh, risk to yourself. I think because of what I experienced in the, in the slums, remembering what my mother went through, it was a total passion on my part. And I think that's what it takes, passion. And not to be afraid of the ramifications. Margaret Sanger, who lived from 1883 to 1966, has been with us uh, in our journey through America's 20th century. We're going to break character now. and. Okay and introduce to you the, the real person who's with us, <laughs> Mona Klinger. Mona Klinger is a member of the faculty at North Idaho College. She is uh, one of the most prominent members of our faculty and is a remarkable uh, instructor in uh, speech communication. Uh, she holds degrees, both bachelor's and master's degrees in the field uh, from the University of Hawaii. And you have also studied under some of the most prominent people in this country uh, dealing with uh, uh, oral interpretation. Mm -hmm. Uh, Mona, thank you for what you've done uh, well, both here you. today and, 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 and at the Popcorn Forum. Uh, let, let's talk a little bit now uh, as you've broken character. Uh, this is not the first person that you've done uh, in this series. It's been going for five years. Uh, what has it meant to you uh, to work under the Chautauqua format and to study uh, an individual in history that, that has uh, been very famous and, and you mm -hmm. take on that role? Well, you call this a journey through time, and I, I call it a wonderful journey. Uh, almost living with a person for a year or whatever, um, everywhere you turn, trying to find out more information. Um, to me, it's a unique, wonderful experience. And it's been so wonderful that I'm trying to provide that experience for my students now. So I would say it, it's frustrating, it's, um, it's scary, but it's also uh, an incredibly wonderful uh, cognitive kind of activity. And lots of work. Oh, lots of work. Lots of work. And you never feel as though you know enough. I was just praying that you wouldn't ask me a question that I wouldn't have the answer to. Well, you, <laughs> you were remarkable in character. Uh, and uh, the, for four or five months, in your case, it's been over a year mm -hmm. uh, that you study. In addition to the morning presenters and the scholars, we have people on panels. We had over 45 people this year, and they all take a lot of time. And work. They do. Mm -hmm. What kind of recommendation would you have to someone who's considering uh, doing a historical character? What, what are the, some of the things they should look for in preparing? Well, first of all, you have to find a character that has a lot of life. And we have to realize that these characters with a lot of life 
have wonderful parts of their personage, and they also have a lot of warts, I like to call them. But you have to find something with somebody with a richness. And uh, find somebody that may, you may not have to like the person totally, but you have to like either what they've done or what they've achieved. I would say start with the internet, encyclopedias, and then uh, read, if, if at all possible, their autobiographies, and then keep on going. It, it's a never-ending battle. And, and isn't it true that you must be intellectually honest and uh, yes. you look at the good or the bad and the person or, or, or the pers person's not perfect? There's a lot of things I did not admire in Margaret Sanger, mm -hmm. a lot of things. And you can't uh, put people on pedestals or... or, or... No, uh, in fact, uh, who could we put on a pedestal? Uh, I was thinking about this the other day. Um, anybody that we portray in the Chautauqua uh, format uh, has flaws. Uh, in fact, I think I told you that we couldn't even put St. Paul up there because of the lifestyle that he ha had for a while. So um, you have to just see them as human beings, but wonderful things that they've done. I admire you so much, and, and you're, you're such a, a great colleague, and you, you inspire students to learn and study. After doing this over the years, and you've also moderated a lot of panels, mm -hmm. and you're excellent at that, uh, how has this changed you as a person uh, over the last five years in, in being part of the Chautauqua format? Well, I uh, did a, another character, Josephine Butler, and I actually sought out places in, in uh, Liverpool where she lived. I mean, so in other words, I made that a big part of, mm -hmm. of vacation one time. Uh, whenever I talk to somebody, if I have a, a Margaret Sanger quote, I, I find myself using Margaret Sanger words occasionally. Um, I, I think, what would Margaret Sanger do in this particular situation? So it's almost like getting into their skin. Uh, that's been exciting. Thank you. That's a wonderful note on which to bring the program to conclusion. Mona Klinger, uh, representing the life of Margaret Sanger, thank you for being with us on the program. It was a delight having you here. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you will join us again next week. We're going to continue what we call our journey through the 20th century America. Uh, we have some other individuals to bring you, and on our upcoming programs, we're going to do two or three people at a time that are local people who were served on panels and were famous people in history. Uh, the reaction that we get from you and, and our audience here on campus has been most warming and rewarding to us uh, in bringing this series to you. And as I said, we have a few more programs to bring you uh, in the weeks that lie ahead called Journey Through the 20th Century America. Until then, please have a good week. I am Tony Stewart. North Idaho College Public Forum is the longest running public television show of its type in North America and is seen in seven states and two Canadian provinces. Each episode is pre-recorded live and is an educational community outreach from North Idaho College. Please join us again at this same time next week for another new edition of North Idaho College Public Forum on this public television station.